morning. So thank you everyone for being here this morning. Special thanks to Ricardo, Nima and Eric for the invitation. Special thanks to Gustavo and Vito for the help and to Abby, I don't know if she's here, for all the help. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Actually, it's going to be a different talk. It's going to be a very interactive talk. I'm going to ask you more questions than you are going to ask me questions, okay? And it's a very, uh, it's kind of work that uh, I don't know if anybody's doing or how do you care, especially with chronic patients in stroke? You do what you have to do. The emergency system is fantastic. Dr. Lopez showed a fantastic lecture about AI, but what happens to the, pa to the patient six months, one year, two years, three years after? So I know that, uh, are there many physical therapists here in the room? Yeah, good. Speech therapists here? Nurses, maybe. Yes. So you are the people that most deal with chronic patients. So you are going to teach me a lot. Okay. So I come from Brazil and as it's an innovation talk uh, conference, I'm going to see what the, where do I advance here? I guess I'm lost here. Oh, here. Sorry. So disclosures. I have no interest of conflict. Some uh, slides is from my collaboration from University of Zurich and the Charity Hostel in Germany, where I had a meeting in Switzerland in 2020, just before the pandemics, where we have discussed a lot about brain hibernation and the chronic situations, what is very interesting. I'm going to present some real world data so some cases are well documented, some cases are not well documented. You have to believe me a little bit. If you don't, that's fine. And let's go. So the first thing is we developed. Oh, for, so what's this brain? I forgot to tell in the beginning. It's brain revascularization to activate inert neurons. We divided the project that's been on in the last three years in brain A and brain C. Brain A acute and chronic. And chronic, you can divide in occlusive stroke and non-occlusive stroke. Doesn't matter for me. It matter how the patient is after all these months, okay? So to start with, I present the case here. What would you do? This patient, she's a woman, she works, she has four kids, she was healthy. Maybe she had some hypertension, but she's not very aware of that. She's in poor social condition. She arrives at the public hospital, 45 years, nine hours arriving with this image. Hemiplegia, left hemiplegia, and there is no endovascular urgence in our service. There is none. So what do you do? You just care about her hypertension, say that's fine, go to physical therapy, and she's going to be probably with a huge deficit in her life. So what we did, we did the, this angel CT, showed a large vessel occlusion on the right side, and it took her to the OR. It was one o'clock a.m. The anesthesiologist was fed up because nobody did that before, so he didn't want to help a lot. And we found this trifurcation thrombos in M1, M2. There was no way to see how it was before. So we did the intervention, Patient did fine after, and she returned home one week after, almost to a normal life. It was a big achievement for her, a big achievement in the public hospital. That's not my work. It's been done a lot. Yeah, not a lot, but some centers do. And it's not the purpose here to compare surgery with endovascular. Endovascular is the main stay of stroke care. I'm just show you, showing you some interesting, interesting things about the acute care. So what I'm going to show you now, after doing this case, we went back to the lab, as I'm known for the placenta guy, maybe you know me for the placenta guy, we try to reproduce what we do in a stroke scenario with endovascular and surgery, and we actually published a new technique, how to intervene microsurgically in stroke. So first thing we did this, I don't know if you ever saw that, how does it look like a strength driver in removing the thrombos? We had these natural thrombos in the placenta. We took a strength driver and we forced it through the vessels, see how much force it 
supplied to the vessel. See how how much thrombus you can you can have uh, pushed back, and how is the vessel after? Did it stop the video? So let's see if it runs. Okay, then then it didn't stop it. Okay. Then I'm, I'm changing, how can we do it microsurgically? How can, can you open it longitudinal, transversally? How big do you need to open? Then we did this and we published this case. I'm going to show you it just to, because it's very curious, how do you move the thrombus microsurgically? So you have, you have the vessel very and you do two stitches and that's all. Then we got to this situation, real cases. What I want to, you to pay attention here, I've, we found that there are two kinds of thrombos that make a huge difference for us. This is the thrombos made of blood clots, let's call it like this. It's a bluish appearance of the external surface of the vessel. You remove it very easy, very quickly. You close it very well. It goes very well. We had a little bit of, not a little bit, we have good success with some patients. Then we move it to this case. Not, not before moving to this case. We published the 212 technique that is very straightforward. I talked with a lot of, of neurosurgeons around, around the world. How do you do microsurgical turn back to me? There was no defined standard for, for a pattern to do that. So I published the 212. What's the 212? You make it two punctures in the vessel, one puncture, other puncture. You make one cut, transversal. You milk the thrombus out and you put two stitches. And it's a very straightforward procedure. Procedure. You need to have a little bit of practice, but the blood uh, starts to flow again in very, very nicely. So that was very nice. We almost saved, you can't say saved it, some patients' lives. But then we have this situation. What's the difference here? That's my big question. What's the difference here? What do you see that's different from the previous cases? The vessel color, do you agree with me? There is no bluish appearance here. It's all white. What does it mean? It means that the clot is rich of inflammatory fibrin. It's not a lot of blood clot. It makes a huge difference. And uh, we, we could remove this clot. It's like doing an endarterectomy of M1 or M2. But at the end, the blood, we had some flow. But minute, minutes after, the flow stopped it. We open it again, the flow stopped it. We open it again, the flow stopped it. And now I, I, I made a conclusion myself. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Eric, Ricardo, Nima, do you, do you have an opinion about this difference of thrombus? It's just a simple question, but <laughs> okay. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> good, good, good. Could you tell me, please, uh, which one do you will go better after? Why it's not improving or improving? Yeah, we, we have studied this a lot. Yes, uh, with Raul Nogueira and uh, and Walid Bridget and and others. Again, what you show in the first case, what you call red plot in in in, uh, in the narrow intervention. Uh, that's a lot of red blood cells, works really well for whatever tool. And right. nice to learn that's true also for microsurgery. Right. Just for, for people in the audience, Brazil just got approved from back to me on the, uh, what we call the Brazilian Medicaid plus Medicare. We call that SUS. My, Marcelo works in a program like that. They don't have a thrombectomy guy in the hospital to do a thrombectomy. So puts him in a situation that he has the opportunity to do this, that is something that in our, in our center, if you take a patient for a surgical thrombectomy, uh, I'm going to have Dr. Nima said, you're doing what? Uh, why? And all the other neurologists, rightly so, because we have, a, a, that's not the case where he works. So uh, the uh, create, creativity uh, surfaces on, on, on places that have more need, and that's, Marcella, beautiful what you're doing. Uh, with that, with that uh, sidetrack, so the red clot, uh, uh, easy for thrombectomy. The white clot is the problem because it could be thromboembolic, but there's a good chance here you're dealing with intrinsic plaque. And even when we do this endovascular, it's hard to say, is there underlying plaque or not? And what I think is, and I'm hopeful that with OCT, we're going to start seeing that there's a phenomenon we call plaque 
uh, 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 erosion that is just a very soft plaque that just get denuded all together and expose all the core of that plaque. And even when we do this with stenting, it, it still has a high risk of reocclusion because of all that uh, uh, core exposed. So there's a good chance this could be mm -hmm. the case here. Right. This also could be a, 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 a white clot uh, that, that is fibrin slash platelet. Now it's, right. we think it's more platelet than fibrin mm -hmm. that is the issue with all these studies of clots that we were involved on. Um, but uh, this one that keeps reocluding most likely is just erosion of a plaque and you're just cleaning that platelet. It looks white because it's platelet. There's no red blood cells and it keeps forming again and forming again. Right. So that's the long answer to your right. question. Right. But one thing, just to a uh, good, uh, uh, there, there are some tools now that are trying to identify what type of clot mm -hmm. before you do the procedure, because it seems to me that that's your next issue now is to right. figure out when you have one or the other, right? right. And right. Uh, so, so there is some work with non-invasive image, but also the other one would be there's some wires that can do it, measure impedance, and that can tell what type of uh, perhaps clot that you're dealing with. And, um, so that's really, um, I don't know if you have any other ways outside of looking from the vessel directly, but before surgery, right. to try to predict that. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. That's exactly and what And one last one, there's a yeah. brilliant Canadian uh, young engineer that yeah. developed something that we work on with Laszlo Miskocho and I was a research fellow in Buffalo, is an angioscope. So these Canadian guys came with a balloon that you go very close to the, the distal carotid, almost at the carotid T. And then you, you arrest flow and you go with a camera and you look at the clot literally with a camera to see if this, just like you're showing here, mm -hmm. white or red, right. they can go there and look at the clot. So take a picture of the clot with a micro camera at a tip of a 14 wire that will tell you red or white and might change your intervention. Yeah, no, that's excellent. That's exactly what we found. So if you have a red clot, straight, very good results. If you have a white White clot is very bad. People, the, the patient, we're not going to, it's not going to recover, and it's very hard. And actually, we have this uh, case. You can have Ricardo doing the surgery from here yeah, down right. there. So that <laughs> I think that would be the way. You don't need aspiration. I'll show you. Okay, so we have those cases and we started doing and some patients got better, the red clot, the white clot didn't. So we, we decided, so if it's a white clot, we need to do the bypass. If it's a red clot, we need to do the microsurgical anatomy. So I'm talking about the acute, acute stroke and I didn't start the presentation yet, okay? So I have this patient and I have this imaging and we decided, we didn't know if it's white or, or red, we decided to go to a bypass. And uh, actually, the bypass, the video shows after that, yeah. Both running the bypass works and the patient recovered pretty well uh, after surgery. I mean, more than we, we didn't do anything so uh, with a very strong vaccine. But uh, then that's it. That's the, the, the pathology aspect of the, the white clot. And we see a lot of fibrin, a lot of uh, inflammatory reaction. And we think this is very difficult. Why am I show you that? Because to this kind of patient, it have a lot of inflammatory reaction. And uh, if it block it again in the same spot, same spot, it will block in another spot in the an artery, another place in the brain. Then we started to think about why don't you look after to do something in the chronic phase after the infl inflammation has gone, after the, if the patient, the patient survives, can you do anything to add to this patient? Then you started the brain C. So the down come from here, not from here, Raul and Ricardo and Dr. Lopez everywhere. And we started to, to look at uh, how chronic patients are dealt in the world. And uh, besides the nurse, the physical therapy, speech pathologist, not much has been done in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. So we still have uh, some percentage of patients that uh, don't get better or they die. And in my opinion, I'm very convinced it's because it's inflammatory phase, because if it is white clot, because they keep on occluding, occluding, and, and, and so forth. 
So what's, what's the brain C? Brain C is that we did a project with people with more than six months of stroke with a functional deficit, we should do something. First, big problem we had, uh, we're talking about a public health system in Brazil, we had uh, not well or good access to physical therapy and speech pathologies, what makes a huge difference. And not because there was there is no profession in the hospital, because people could not access the service. So that was a huge problem. And it's very different from cost study, because the purpose is completely different from cost. Then we added another type of patient, the non-occlusive stroke. When I started to, to, to discuss about revascularization to a non-occlusive stroke, people thought that I was crazy and nobody supported me. So what are the targets in a chronic patients? The motor functional recover, the cognitive or language impairment, we see a lot, emotional improvement, the patients get very depressed or not motivated at all to do any kind of activity. The sleep pattern goes down, the patients start to sleep much worse than they did, and they are all complain a lot of fatigue. Okay, these are most the target points to deal with chronic patients. And there are two theories that I'm going to talk a little bit and show some case in between. One, one uh, theory is the, the blood flow. The blood flow to the brain area can be going down to a hypometabolic, a hibernation state because of lack of demand. It's like the better side of the brain, the normal brain, we take all the activity to the poor brain, let's say that, and then the blood starts to flow less with less demand, less demand to the, to the, to the, to the bad side. And the other theory that's been uh, very uh, dealt in the neurology nowadays is the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system may play a big role with inflammation. So after six months, this patient came to us, not, not very late, she had six months of stroke. She was very fatigued, her, her face was very depressed. She could move the left, the right side, not the left side. And this is six months, we called her to the hospital to see uh, what we could do. On exams, she had a blockage, she, was a, she had a blockage carotid in the, in the, in the right side. And uh, what would you do with a patient six months with a chronic deficit? She did physiotherapy, some physiotherapy, not a very good physiotherapy, physical therapy, and she didn't improve. And she had a right-sided block carotid. Again, I will ask you three, a question again, Ricardo. So <laughs> six months after, blocked carotid, some reasonable access to physical therapy, not that good. And angio CT showed the, the, uh, the infarcted area on the left hemisphere and with some reasonable collaterals and she had a carotid block. Who can answer that for me? I would order an MRI and see what's the extent of the stroke burden. We don't have an MRI, Eric. Sorry. No. We have only an angel CT, a CT in the patient. Yeah, uh, then I would call you to see what you do in those circumstances. <laughs> okay, good question. So the reason I ask you that is, well, we, we really we really didn't have, so I'm telling the truth, okay? So uh, what, uh, what we, 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 we look at, at collaterals. I don't know if you agree with me. Again, I'll ask you three. If an angel CT, do you know the MITEF system? From, from Australia, a guy that published the MITEF system, C1, 2, or 3, and it's based on collaterals. No collaterals, reasonable collaterals are good collaterals. All the patients now, acute or chronic, if they have reasonable to good collaterals, doesn't matter what time, when, we go for revascularization. That's our experience. I'm telling my experience. And we have had success with that. So, Marcelo, just to clarify, you're saying that you have a patient had a, one stroke, one event six months ago. Yes. And is a stable, yes. stable deficit, just so everybody understands. Yes. Stable deficit, carotid occlusion, cervical yes. intracranial. Cervical. Cervical carotid occlusion with a fixed deficit. She's not fluctuating symptoms. Yes. She's bedridden, right yes. hemiparesis, 
degree yes. of aphasia. Exactly. Uh, so you're doing a CTA and you're defining collaterals or not. If yes. there is good collateral, you're revascularizing. Yes. What a, so why you're not revascularizing the one that has no good collateral? Okay, uh, that's a good question. I'm going to answer that. In this case, we, we, I decided, it was a patient of my colleague, I decided with him to, de to go to the carotid disobstruction. Do you know what I mean? Not the bypass. You asked the good question. Do you know what I did? I did. The carotid was occluded, mm -hmm. and it uh, was a matter of bypass. If there is no collateral, we go to bypass. If there are collaterals, we go to the big vessel. Is obstruction, even if it's chronic. That's what I'm trying to say. Gotcha. Understand? And, and, you're so we did. and you're studying this, taking everybody to surgery, or you're randomizing surgery versus no surgery? No, we, we, we unfortunately, I'm not randomizing because I'm having a very hard time to even to do a few cases, okay? Gotcha. Because if nobody believes, nobody trusts this. So in this case, I, I, I we discussed it. I said, no, she has collaterals. So we go, we go to a large vessel. Uh, uh surgery we don't go to bypass surgery so that's what we did we did the next surgery on her we disobstruct the carotid coincidence or not she did the physiotherapy twice a week the family didn't have time whatever one month after in the left leg she was uh, like this we opened the carotid we didn't do the bypass in this case i'm going to show another case so we, we asked her and she tried, she always put the hand to help. We said, not, no, don't put the hand. And at the end, she could move higher up a little bit her leg, what she wasn't doing at all before. Why it happened, in my opinion? And she was very happy. She started to walk two months after. She doesn't have hand movement. Why did it happen, in, in my opinion? I said the collaterals, because if you open a large vessel, with the collaterals, there is some blood flowing. I was afraid of uh, hemorrhage, but the inflammatory phase has passed for a long time. And why did it improve the leg with the, with the large vessel uh, disobstruction? In my belief, because flow is still. She had some collaterals, flow is still, that she have a great improvement of ACA and the leg area was more uh, irrigated with blood. I don't know if you agree with that or not. So I started looking at the literature and I had this, seen this publication that is very interesting. That's from 2018 that talks a lot about inflammation and blood vessel regeneration and neural network rewiring, brain plasticity. And um, the vascular impairment and the misery perfusion with uh, extracranial intracranial bypass surgery. We didn't do that to this patient. We're going to show again a patient. And uh, to improve in chronic patients, not subacute patients. So let's stop it. Too. I think it blocked it here. Can you show the next slide or it's not working here? Okay, now it's working. So all the neurovascular, neurovascular engagement and the steel phenomenon. The steel phenomenon is what I believe to happen in these cases where you have a blocked large vessel occlusion and you have less blood flowing to the leg area. Okay, so now I'm coming from, I'll explain a little bit of theories. I'm going to show more patients in a while. This is from University of Zurich where they, they made a with the boat, the boat, the MRI, where they have uh, where they have a flow supply over time in chronic ischemia, and this demand this demand monthly by monthly was diminishing in the affected area. Why I'm saying that because you have the secondary area of neurons around the ischemic area that they, they are they get into like a hypometabolic state of less demand and the, the blood steel flow phenomenon drives the blood away from that area so that's the reason so it's like a tree in the winter it's a real hibernation of the bad side of the brain but the good side of the brain starts to get it all so the patient chronically starts to lose function not to lose function or never recover, recover function on that side. 
So they did, uh, we, did, we discussed that's from Zurich, this slide is from Zurich, and how the hibernating brain would behave in chronic patients. So now we got to this, can, who can interpret this image for me? What do you see? Again. This is a, a SPECT and uh, an MRI. Who can tell me what you see? There is a left um, MCA territory infarct, it looks like. Yes, what else? Great, thanks. What else do you see? Who the tells me what else? Is... Uh, yeah, what's going on that cerebellum on the right cerebellum? Right. What, what, what is that? Do you know what is that? What's happening with the cerebellum here? Uh, there's a phenomenon called diaschesis yes. that you can see that on perfusion imaging. When you have a hypoperfusion of hemisphere, uh, this ipsilateral or contralateral cerebellum can have hypoperfusion. I think it might be what you're seeing. Yes, yes, Ricardo. And why is that important? Do you have an opinion, Ricardo? No. Does anyone have an opinion about why I'm showing that? Why the diaschesis, cerebellar diaschesis in this patient, that's a chronic patient, has an important importance in recovery? Does anyone can take a guess? So it's a very interesting phenomena that we started seeing in chronic patients that did it improve. And we, we found a lot of work being done with that from Germany and from Switzerland. And actually what happens, a lot of, uh, that's the bold MRI. And every time you, you get an ischemic deficit in the cortex, uh, you, the cerebellum, the contralateral cerebellum starts to diminish function. And this function that's diminished, that, that's reducing, impairs the recovery of the motor cortex. So it's not only a matter of uh, cortex motricity, it's a matter also of cerebellum control, cerebellar control. And how I'm saying, why I'm saying that, because I'm going to discuss this a little after. Besides that, we have the theory of, uh, of the glymphatic system. I don't know, maybe everyone is aware of with the glymphatic system. So the theory with the glymphatic system, with this reduced blood flow, reduced cell activity in this hemisphere, we have a lot of accumulation of metabolic waste around the vessels. So even if you don't have an occlusion in the vessel, the neurons that are around it get less function. And that's the glymphatic pathway. And uh, then I'm going to move to another method. It's a, it's, it's a little bit, I don't know if it's too much confusing, but that's how we built this, this thinking about chronic patients. So we started to look again, how do you treat chronic patients? And one of the most researched things they do nowadays is this transcranial magnetic stimulation. Does anyone have experience with that, with this here in the room? So if in the transcranial magnetic stimulation, one of the theories is that when you, let me show here, when you stimulate the bad side of the brain, you have to inhibit the good side of the brain. So it, why, why does, it, does it work? Because you take more blood to the bad side of the brain and you do less cell activity on the good side of the brain. So you have like more blood, blood flowing to the bad side of the secondary area or tertiary area. And then the patient improves a little. Besides that, you have more depolarization and you have more flow to the bad area, it may be the metabolic waste can go, uh, can be flushed a little bit. So uh, some, work, some research done about motor plasticity after bypass surgery, and uh, the diaschesis that Ricardo told us, the plasticity that happens when the diaschesis uh, is treated, let's see how, and the cortical thickness of the brain, I'm passing, I'm passing here and always, and now the NOVA. The NOVA shows very well what the board has shown that the flow diminishes substantially in um, some months after surgery in the affected side of the brain. So after revascularization, the flow starts again and 
the patient might recover fun function. It's the same idea of the constraint induced movement therapy. That's very simple. It's just to lock the good side of the, the, the body. You have to always use the bad side of the body. So to try to improve blood flow to the affected area. So I call it the bath tube theory. What's the bath tube theory? If the blood doesn't, the blood doesn't go there, if the flow is diminishing, no cell activity, a lot of waste inside. If you put water inside the, the bath tube, it will clean everything. So this patient here now is different situation from the first one. This patient, four years old, he had a carotid stenosis. He had an acute deficit. He was a tennis player. And uh, after that, he was on anticoagulation. Anti, anti and the carotid was recovered, but he had a chronic deficit. We saw him nine months after, and he was not able to walk. He was not able to move his hand at all. In this case, non-occlusive disease, more than six months, then he got, and we did the bypass on him. We did the bypass on him. It doesn't matter if the collaterals or not, there's not occlusive disease, but where are we doing the bypass? Where, in which brain area? Does anyone have a guess? We're doing the bypass in the pre-motor cortex, prefrontal area, why? I'm going to explain you why in a little bit. So coincidence or not, you might say it's a coincidence. Um, 45 days after the surgery, the father brought him and the, 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 the attendant that was with him brought him. They were extremely happy because she could walk on his own. Ah, but she could have done that with a very good physical therapy. Maybe, but he did, but he didn't recover. And he started walking by himself without help. He was not, not able to do that. His mood improved, his sleep pattern improved. And uh, he was also able to do a little bit of finger movements that the father was very, very, very happy. Not, not a lot, but just a little bit. But then another thing came. The father was very happy. And I asked the patient, are you happy with the surgery we did? Now you can walk without assistance. You can move a little better, a better your arm. You can improve, the, improve your mood. He said, no, I'm not happy. I said, why? Because I cannot play tennis as I played before. So the standard of life of patients are so high and he expected to go, expects to go back to normal life as before, that even if you think you help him, maybe you're helping or not. But now I just spoke to his father last week. This was three years ago and he's fine. He's able to go to tennis court and play some tennis. Now he's doing fine now. Okay, but the standards are, are different. This patient, another patient, we, we saw this patient two years after stroke his, his motor function was quite good, let's say, but she ha he had a cerebellar diaschesis that I'm going to uh, uh, explain again. So the cerebellar diaschesis is a disconnection between the cerebellum and the motor cortex of the impaired stroke area. In this case, what we do? We think if we improve the pre-motor pre functional area, the cerebellum will go, will function better. So she has lever apraxia, she has a better uh, movement control. And this patient is a very good case because if you look at the two videos, you're not going to see a huge improvement, but he did not do any kind of physiotherapy. He didn't want, then the pandemics came, he didn't want to go out and nobody could take him out of home. He was very depressed, he was not sleeping well. He, in the hostel, he arrived, he could not walk with without support or without assistance and now he can walk by himself you don't see many improvement but that he's very happy his language Sim, mãe. Somehow... Eu sei, mãe. yeah it's in portuguese he's he, he... Yeah, he knew. Como é que tá? Tá bem? Bem. He... Tá tudo beleza tem certeza he's left uh -huh. he's sleeping better Sim, mãe. Calma he aí, Okay, so uh, that's what we have. Let's see. This patient here, you see that she had a, she, she's a young patient. She had a large uh, stroke. She, I think she was less than 40. 
and she was very impaired. This is a very, very chronic patient. About five years after she came, we did this perfusion image, very bad perfusion, and she went to, to prefrontal revascularization to the prefrontal area. And uh, two months after she was very happy, she started walking again, she started doing some things again. It was very interesting. And she had some still phenomena. Uh, this is another example of the ascheusis. So uh, over time, the, this is the Switzerland research, over time, month after month, the cortex starts to thin and be thinner and thinner and thinner, and the miserable perfusion and flow still to the other side is a huge thing. So there are a lot of interpretation about this data, but we all agree now, we, we people that work with this, that hibernation is what happens with the secondary tertiary area around the ischemic area. So the, the, the revascularization plays an important role because of the cerebellum and not only the motor cortex, as I said before. Here, show, the bold showing some improvement and, and cortex perfusion, also in the cerebellum, the image is not here. You see the cortical thinness, this is from Germany, this slides. And uh, so we started doing this. We revascularized the premotor pre functional area and we saw cerebellar improvement, we saw cognitive improvement, we said motor improvement. We didn't have a good pattern to follow because none of these patients has done excellent physiotherapy. I think with this method and an excellent physiotherapy, we can reach much more. Then I went to the, to the internet and uh, I don't know, Ricardo, do you know Andrea Machado, Ricardo? Yes, and I discussed it with him. I don't know if you saw this paper in Journal of Neurosurgery. I think it was 2018. He's doing an NIH trial. He is from, um, he is from Ohio. And what he's doing now is putting a DBS in the cerebellum. And according to his findings, I just spoke with him last month, according to, the, the trial is going to end next year. According to his findings, when you put a DBS in the dentite nucleus of the cerebellum, he saw the same improvements that we are seeing with surgery, with revascularization of the premotor uh, uh, cortex. And, um, and then the, the, the Zurich people, uh, just published an article uh, this year showing the bypass in the subacute phase, not the chronic phase, that some patients might be eligible after one week of stroke for this, uh, for this improvement. They have their protocol. So why this happens is, I'm going to advance and then I'm going to come back. So here, vessels in the brain. So the, the original bypass, you do to M3 or M4 bypasses. We are targeting a very tiny vessel in the premotor functional area. Why? Because of the disconnection of the prefrontal, the thalamic, and the posterior cerebellar connection. And uh, we think that uh, stimulating the premotor function, the premotor cortex, we will get uh, also a cerebellum stimulation and now the secondary area with more flow and uh, with uh, cerebellum connection, we improve some uh, functions of the patient. Uh, this is some uh, studies telling about the plasticity of the Perkins cells in the cerebellum. And they, that's what we do now. It's, uh, it's uh, I think the placenta helped us a lot. We get the STA and it's like putting an elephant inside a, a, a very small insect. We do a huge bypass to a very, very small vessel in the premotor for, uh, uh, cortex. And um, we, we have seen some improvements. Another tool that we had the time to use was the Kinevo robotic microscope. I have nothing to do with size, but it's an amazing thing that during the bypass or just before the bypass, you, hear, you give contrast to the, the patient and by the, the, flow me, uh, the flow measurement, computer flow measurement, you see where the endocyanin is arriving first and where it's arriving late. 
confirm, confirming our theory that there is a still phenomenon in the cortex, and right after you do the bypass, you change the image in the, the, in the computer. We did the research with this, with the, the placenta measuring different arrival times of the contrast. And the, the last thing I would like to ask, or I'd like to say is, so with this chronic revascularization of the premotor cortex or the Andre Machado in Ohio DBS put in the cerebellum, we had a lot of leg improvement. We have a, lo a lot of cerebellar motor coordination improvement. We had a lot of cognitive improvement, better sleep pattern, less fatigue, but of course the arm and the, 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 the hand are the most difficult part because it's in the middle of the ischemic area and we're not resuscitating ischemic area. So we are, we are also adding to this patient the muscle transfer. What is the muscle transfer? You get the muscle from another part of the body, maybe from the leg. You do a, a connection between the, the to biceps to the pectoral area. So patient can flex the arm also. He, he recovered the, the leg, he covered more improvement of coordinate, mortal coordination. Now he can flex the arm, what helps him a lot, a lot in the daily life. So I, did, I don't want to prove anything to anybody. I just want to tell my experience here. And I'm very thankful to you. This slide, the end the slide, my family. And the end the slide is just to give hope to, to an area that's no, no hope at all. Okay, thank you very much.